art nerds. So in the past, we have done constructive figure drawing. I've shown you guys how to draw basic 3D volumetric shapes, and I've shown you how to draw those into a still life. Today, we're going to be starting a very short series on drawing animals. I'm really excited to get started on this with you guys because I'm teaching this next week in my drawing class with the Little Art House, so I'm excited to share with those kids as well. Today, we're just going to do some really basic animal drawing and we're just going to take several animals break them down into basic shapes and focus on that in subsequent videos we're going to just we're going to decide how to draw stick figure versions of these animals and then use volumetric construction to construct these animals as 3d forms so i hope you guys will keep an eye out for those So we're starting with a lion and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a line of action and then I'm going to draw kind of a long rectangle and I'm not focused so much on volumetric perspective today. I'm just kind of focusing on capturing the major shapes of the animal and there are a lot of really good YouTube channels that focus more on drawing animals like Aaron Blaze's YouTube channel is an excellent resource for that but for today just gonna kind of practice drawing the basics so we've got a male lion here you can tell from the picture and you can also tell from the mane and I'm just kind of loosely sketching in with a color pencil so we have the basic form sketched in. Now I'm going to start kind of refining our forms and thinking about our forms. So I know the rib cage would be up here. You can actually, in the picture, kind of see his rib cage. He's kind of a skinny lion. And then this part sticks down a little bit. His front leg, his foreleg is visible, but we can't really see his paw. But I know there's a paw down there somewhere. Then we have the back legs, which are digigrade legs. And if you guys want to better understand how to draw animals, sometimes checking out what furry artists are up to and what they're drawing is a good way to kind of understand how to cartoon animals. Also, going to the zoo and doing animal studies can be a really good way to better understand how to draw animals or watching animal documentaries. And then we have his lion neck, which is going to be hidden by his mane. And then we have his head. So... Like I said, we're really just kind of focusing on boxing in all the shapes. So I'm breaking down the fur in his mane into kind of discrete sections. And when I'm doing drawings like this, studies like this, I'm just kind of, this is kind of like my research, right? My preliminary start, just to kind of get a feel for things. So I kind of understand what areas I'm going to need to improve, what areas I need to study more. So like I can already tell that musculature, posing, dynamism, those are all going to be things I'm going to want to focus on in the future so I can better understand how this animal is built. Also, having a good understanding of the volumetric forms. So, not going to be a great lion, but that's okay. We're just kind of doing our little fact-finding mission today. So, this is today's warm-up. So, I haven't even done any of my warm-up drawings. I decided I wanted to share my warm-up drawing process with you guys and also get some animal drawing practice in. Okay, so this is 
Terrible lion number one. Let's turn the page and draw another one. Okay, so in this shot, we have two lines. We have a female and a male lion. And we're going to start sketching them. So the female lion is more from the front. So you can actually kind of see that she's in a bit of a loaf pose. And hopefully, as I draw these lines for you guys and I get my hand warmed up, the drawings will start to improve. And then we have the male lion next to her. And I think this is kind of a good exercise anyway, especially if it can show how doing warm-ups is beneficial and helps your art improve as you warm up and limber up your hand, loosen up. It's a really cold day today, and it would have been good to do my warm-ups ahead of time because my arthritis is acting up, which makes it a little bit harder for me to draw. My hand's a little bit stiffer than I would like, but if this can be a good reason, a good uh, example of why doing warm-ups is beneficial, then I'm happy to bite the bullet and draw some unattractive art for you guys. So I'm just kind of loosely sketching in their forms. Again, we're gonna focus now on just kind of tightening things up, but not too, too much since we're on our fact-finding mission. We really just wanna kind of start to understand the basic forms that animal bodies can take. I have several animals selected for this exercise. We have lions, we have bears, we have elephants, we have bats, we have dolphins. So I wanted to select kind of a variety of animals to draw for you guys today, just so we could start kind of maybe finding some commonalities with animal bodies. So I've been working on drawing more animals over the past few years. My Lilliputian living challenges usually feature animals, insects, and plants. But this is an area I'm kind of just always weak in. I've always been kind of weak with drawing animals. So this is definitely worth the time investment and worth improving. So generally, I do my warm-up drawings drawing people from reference using Senshi Stock, and I have a bunch of tutorials on this channel where I talk about doing just that. You guys can find those, I think, linked under my favorite tutorials playlist, and that's right there on the front page, so you guys should be able to find that pretty easily. But I think doing some animal warm-ups is a great way to kind of keep my brain elastic and help me draw some things that I'm not naturally good at, things that don't come easily to me. I know as artists, especially if you're looking to make a buck, if you're looking to make a living, it can be very tempting to just always stick with the things you're good at. And uh, when I'm teaching, I usually encourage people to draw things they like. And often, yes, the things you like are the things you're good at, but I actually really like animals and I don't draw them enough. So this is a good opportunity. And sometimes you might think you don't like something and then you start drawing it and you realize you actually really enjoy it. So that's why it's good to kind of mix things up, try new things. If you just really, really hate it and it's not worth your time, you can always nix it if it's absolutely not working for you. But sometimes you find that you really enjoy the challenge and you want to get really good at it. So it's worth, even if it wasn't something you would naturally be drawn to, it's something you decide you wanna keep working on and keep honing. And that kind of determination is really vital if you wanna work as an artist. So it's something you wanna, see I should've pushed the two lines closer together, but uh, it's something you wanna kinda hone. It's like a muscle, you can exercise it. So I'm just keeping all of these forms fairly basic. We're in our exploration phase. I'm just kind of noticing, oh, say like this leg, because it's a digigrade leg, it does go backwards like that. 
A lot of mammals have those kind of legs. And then noticing where those joints are. And then when we do our animal stick figure video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reference skeletons of different animals and use those to kind of find a very basic stick figure. Okay, so that's our second set of lions. So next, as you guys can see, we have a lovely brown bear to draw. I'm going to try to get a couple on here. I feel like I'm chunking through my sketchbook pretty quick at one sketch per page. So what I'm doing, as you guys can see, we have a brown bear who's sitting. So I'm kind of sketching the major gesture, kind of figuring out the form as a whole. Now I'm going to try and break this down into usable parts. And I think what's going to be interesting is when we start comparing the skeletons of the animal to the actual mass of the animal, because I know a lot of these animals, um, they carry a lot of extra, extra fat on them to like help with uh, winter hibernation like bears, or they have blubber on them to kind of help with dealing with cold seas, or they have a lot of fur on them, which really obscures the skeleton and the forms. So I think it's important to both understand the skeleton of the animal, just like we understand the skeleton of a human for basic human construction, but also understand how these forms are changed as we draw the mass of the animal. So now I have to put my thinking cap on because the actual face of the bear is a little bit challenging for me. So one tip I learned, or one trick I learned while I was at SCAD, and I actually want to put this into practice soon, but I have a lot of junk, so I'm not looking to acquire more stuff necessarily, is um, just owning figurines of different animals, like realistic animal figurines, and that way you can practice drawing them from different angles. And I'm just kind of roughing in the fur. And then there's like a back foot. And of course, how I'm going about drawing animals and how I'm demonstrating for you guys, um, I would say that much like drawing people, this is an art that can take years and years and years to master. I'm not pretending like I'm going to master it today. This is just kind of a tertiary or a, um, not a tertiary, a exploratory video, just kind of walking through things, drawing the basic major forms and kind of understanding the gesture of the animal. Okay, so we've got another bear and this one is walking. So I'm just going to rotate my canvas a little bit. So what I'm noticing is we've really got kind of two major forms that are kind of overlapping with the head over here. And then we have a really low hanging tongue and then the foot back there so part of what I'm trying to do is I'm just trying to figure out mm, the most quintessential gesture of the animal if that makes sense so something that is readable and I feel like this is pretty readable as a bear in terms of like we've got that lumbering mass and just kind of quickly sketching it in 
Now what I should have done is compact this a lot more. So this hump here should be closer to the head. And then we have like the neck mass. So it looks like on bears, the necks are either bigger than the head or they have maybe more fur or more fat to kind of keep the head warm maybe. And they also have these huge foreheads. So already it's kind of starting to look like a bear. And I feel like my challenge is really cut out for me showing these kids how to draw animals because a lot of it animals obviously really vary in terms of just like between mammals and reptiles there's a lot of variance insects add a lot of variance fish just any aquatic animals add a lot of variance right it there so there's a lot more diversity in terms of drawing animals than there is say in drawing people but I think really what's most important, and perhaps this is what's more challenging, is teaching people how to look and how to analyze and how to get the gist. So much of drawing, so much of being an artist, being a comic artist, being an illustrator, is working with your reference and learning how to interpret your reference and understand your reference and break it down into something that you can draw if you need to, draw it again and again and again, or break it into something that looks like you drew it, that has your art style to it. So we're moving on from bears to one of my favorite animals, raccoons. And they are related, but uh, I just love these little trash pandas so much. They're seriously so cute and so feisty. I love raccoons. Anyway, so raccoons like bears have a lot of their body mass, a lot of their bulk is actually in their torso, which is pretty different from, say, humans. Um, they tend to also be kind of compact, like when they're when they're hunched over when they're walking when they're eating things they tend to be very compact like to protect themselves and their soft soft tummies so that's something i want to think about as i'm sketching this reckon from reference this little dude is very like a very hunched over in a protective stance Still so cute. I know some people are not raccoon people at all. I've had raccoons ruin two trash cans and uh, try to tear up my compost heap, my composting bin. So I know. Oh, and I've had raccoons get into my mom's garage before too and eat all of one of my cat's food. And I know they're they are have a higher chance of carrying rabies. Like you can't vaccinate them. Like I get it. I can still like raccoons, y'all. I can be wrong and like raccoons. And they have these cute little bub bub noses. And then, so the little divot, I don't really know what that's called, but like cats, dogs, bears, lions, all of those mammals have them. Raccoons, it's not so apparent. And this is gonna look like he's smiling. He's really baring his teeth. He's not a happy raccoon. Then, because he's snarling, his little cheekies have like lifted up. I'm probably spending too much time trying to actually draw this individual raccoon rather than catching the, the gesture. And that's the problem for me when I'm drawing animals I really like is I'll want to spend more time drawing them when really the whole point of this exercise is just to understand the basics, understand the different forms, kind of have a better grasp on drawing animals and just practice.
So he's looking a bit cat-like, which, I mean, isn't all that surprising. But if I were drawing a raccoon character, I would definitely want to push the individual features that make a raccoon look like a raccoon. I feel like a Lilliputian who has a raccoon either as like a mount or as like an oversized pet would be like the most baller Lilliputian. I want to draw that now. Like you'd obviously have to raise a raccoon from a kit because I don't think an adult raccoon would ever, and it would also call all the shots in the relationship. Like you would have to be just pretty down, maybe like a wildling. Lilliputian would have a raccoon because they've got common goals. Oh my gosh. Can you imagine a Lilliputian with a bow and arrow on the back? Like, Nyang. So anyway, all right. So that is one raccoon down. I think I have another one. So next we have a really, really cute the baby raccoon and this little fella has kind of a hunch to his back and his little tail's all fluffed out he's got big old eyes and big old ears and what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to just kind of be mindful as I'm sketching this little little fella, little little baby, out of just kind of how everything looks, where everything is. I'm not trying to overthink it. I'm not trying to engineer this raccoon. I'm not trying to reverse engineer this raccoon. I'll do that later on in other videos. I'm just trying to get the basic gestures in. And he's all fluffed out. And his fur is kind of just sticking out every which way. And the purpose behind me doing these exercises is just to kind of ease me in to the longer task. To kind of familiarize myself. So generally, what I would recommend, if you were developing animal characters yourself or you want to start drawing more animals or what have you, is I would recommend you start like this where you just do some exploratory sketches, just trying to get some experience under your belt. Then study the musculature. If you're drawing specific animals, maybe do several studies, draw them in several different poses, practice drawing where their shading is, where their fat is, practice rendering their fur, and then work on cartooning them if, if you decide you want to cartoon them. And I also really recommend, and we'll talk about this more in another video, is you kind of pick other artists who do what you want to do and they do it really well and just kind of analyze how they're doing it, why they're doing it, what choices they're making, their thought process behind those choices, that sort of thing. Because a lot of the leg work, a lot of the figuring things out has actually been done before us and our challenge is just to figure out how we want to adapt it to fit our own work. We've drawn three types of land mammals, lions, bears, and raccoons. Let's move on to an air mammal. So we have a few bat photos to study from. So 
what we're going to start with, and I don't think I've left myself enough room for the wings, so I'll just move this down here. And again, we're really just focusing on major forms, kind of just capturing the gesture of the animal. And it looks like up here, bats have a couple of muscle masses, which makes sense. They have the wings that they have to power. And then I know I'm going to struggle with his little batty face. So I'm going to do the best that I can, but without further study, I don't know that I can really do it just justice. So, plus bats have like these very interesting noses that I don't, haven't had a lot of chance to practice yet. So, oh my gosh, oh no, this bat's kind of cute. He's smiling, he's making a little murp-murp face. And then he's got these large ears. Something else I recommend that you guys do, and it's something I didn't do when I was younger is rather than just copying what your favorite, how your favorite artists draw animals, and I know I said to reference your favorite artists, but I don't mean just always draw, let's use cats as the example, because that's what I was guilty of. Okay, um, I read a lot of like Dizzy Tourette, I read a lot of Azamanga Dayo, and they draw cats very, very simply. You guys can kind of see that reflected when I cartoon cats, and when I draw pancake. Um, and even though I had a cat, Remy, and I've had Bowie for a long time too, I was really reliant instead on just drawing the caricature of a cat rather than realistically drawing cats and then developing a caricature from that. So that's something I wish, as a teenager, I wish I'd spent more time just drawing animals from reference and it wasn't necessarily something that was I mean I like I said I had cats so I didn't have an excuse for cats but the internet was a very different place and photo sharing was a very different place and reference was a very different place back then Wikipedia was still a new thing so you know there isn't really a good excuse now we have access to so many wonderful references we have access to YouTube channels like um Tito the raccoon, we don't really have a good excuse for not practicing more from reference. Okay, so there is one of our bats. All right, so we have another bat up. You guys probably noticed I'm mostly drawing animals in twos. I'm trying to get different angles or different postures or different gestures. Something I'm noticing about this little bat and we're going to end up overlapping over here is there's a lot. This little bat is very different from this guy over here. He's got huge ears and he's got very small face. I honestly, I really can't see what's going on with his face too much so I'll leave that for another day we'll do that a little bit better later on we're just gonna focus mostly on capturing some of the other details he also looks like he's super soft When I'm working with my 10 year olds, I usually describe this as little potato bodies. I'm gonna run out of page for his wings. That's okay. I mean, they do take up a lot of space. And he's also got So 
So we're going to do the best with the page that we have left. And one of the reasons I point out that instead of just copying what your favorite artists are doing wholesale and never doing your own research, it's really beneficial to do your own research. Um, for example, let's, let's go with Sonic. Let's go with Rouge the Bat. Okay, like she doesn't look anything like real bats. I mean, Sonic doesn't look like a hedgehog either. So those are just, I mean, they could on, honestly be almost any animals and we would just have to be like, uh-huh, sure. Like, just take it with a grain of salt. And it's like Mickey doesn't really look like a mouse. So that's why it's kind of beneficial for us to spend this time. What I really think is the best way to do it is to spend some time studying the animals, drawing the animals, practicing the animals. If you need inspiration, if you need a direction to go, checking out how other people draw these animals and then trying to merge what you noticed about the animals and what is true about the animals with how other people typically draw the animals. So from the air to the sea, we've got a couple of dolphins. I'm just going to draw them both just like we did with the lions. And the dolphins seem to be pretty simple. I bet the skeleton's going be, <laughs> gonna to be exciting and a bit of a nightmare because um, I have a feeling there's a lot going on that's all just being compressed and we can't really see it. So that'll be an interesting thing to revisit. But for now, we've got things pretty easy. Now me personally, I don't like those step-by-step -step how to draw videos that like, let's draw a cat, draw a circle, draw two triangles, draw a circle, draw a C shape, draw a, no, I don't like those, okay? I, I know they are good for very young artists, people who want immediate results, but the way I'm showing you guys, I'm hoping we're gonna build good habits together, that we're gonna build, um, abilities and skill sets and ways of seeing and ways of looking at things that aren't just an immediate answer but are an actual skill set that's going to serve you for a really long time because that is useless you can only do exactly that cat over and over and over again and uh, I really am not a fan of I think it's I think it's like handing people candy instead of food and telling them it's food right like it solves the problem immediately, but it causes more problems later on. So with our dolphins, we've got our noses and these are conical. And then they have kind of this like eye ridge going on that kind of connects in with their little beaks. I'm not a dolphin person, I apologize. My best friend in high school was a super duper duper dolphin person, and uh, I think they're kind of scary. <laughs> but I recognize that they're very popular, some people think they're really cute. I'm drawing the eyes too far back. That's okay, we're still doing our exploratory So we have a dorsal fin, that's the fin on the back. Seems to be right after the hump, but that could just be the pose these dolphins are in. Then we have two fins that are coming off right by the face. Those would probably have been the forearms. I know, four limbs, four legs. I know Cetaceans, like whales and dolphins, at one point in their evolutionary history were land animals. Something else, I'm not doing it on camera, but 
if I'm struggling with something, if I draw something incorrectly, I will draw it again and again until I get it right. I don't bother with erasing. I just completely redraw it. I find that it's better. It's helped me improve more over the years and I find that it's just better to redraw it than it is to try and incorrect something. Actually do not like how these dolphins turned out. They're so simple that uh, a little bit wrong with them is going to be very apparent. That's the, the problem with simplicity is that when you mess up, it's very obvious. Okay, so we have two more dolphins. And they are most definitely potato animals. I would say, like, okay, if I was really breaking this down volumetrically, I would do um, kind of like a cylinder, but they're really kind of shaped like a banana. But we're gonna focus on that a little bit more in another upcoming video. So not really gonna go into that too, too much today. And honestly, I prefer doing these kind of studies using a sketchbook, right? I, got, I would prefer not to do them digitally. Um, I'm sure some of you guys would prefer to do them digitally. That's probably fine as long as you're not hitting a race a million times or undo a million times because that's not really the point. Um, it's okay to make mistakes. You can't fix everything. Maybe you shouldn't fix everything. And sometimes leaving those mistakes adds more character and personality. I mean, Bob Ross isn't wrong when he talks about happy little accidents. And I think sometimes with digital stuff, we lose that. But um, the, just doing it digitally, there's nothing wrong with that. But for those of you who maybe think this is a waste of a sketchbook or because not every single drawing is going to be perfect, you're finding it frustrating and you may lose interest in it. I wanna say that mistakes Bad drawings, poor drawings, mistake drawings, accidents, those are all valuable. Those all have a purpose. We can't do everything perfectly all the time. So I know on YouTube, we often only share our good stuff. On Instagram, we only share our good stuff. But it's important to make mistakes because that's how you learn. Either it's the pain of having to redo it teaches you a lesson. Oh, you can't even see this little guy's tail. Or just how <laughs> ugly it is makes you decide you're going to try harder next time. Maybe you're going to spend a little bit more time on it. Or maybe you're going to research a little bit more. But making mistakes is valuable. So we did under the sea. Let's go back to the land with a truly massive mammal. We've got an elephant up next. And I don't know that I've ever drawn a not cartoony elephant. So this will be an exciting adventure for me. So, ah, thanks Prismacolor, you're great. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to start off kind of with what I know. And we have this massive box form. Now, this looks like it's an African elephant. In fact, it says it's an African elephant. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna start refining some of the major forms that I'm seeing here. So the back looks like it's got two humps. I think that's how you can tell an African elephant from an Indian elephant anyway. And then the head, there's not really a lot of neck going on here. So, and then the legs, if they are digigrade legs, it's not super noticeable. Looks like the trunk goes all the way down 
to the ground so that's something to keep in mind but you see I'm sketching everything really loose I'm really just kind of trying to explore the forms and for today's exercise I intentionally avoided doing household pets and I did not I don't think I included any birds I may have at the end but I excluded household pets because that is my crutch that is what if I'm gonna draw animals that's what I always draw is cats and dogs and lizards and I wanted to draw things that I don't draw a lot because this is practice for me this is an opportunity for me to learn as well so something that i like about teaching is that it often presents an opportunity for me to hone my own skills to polish my own skills or to learn something new to take time and work on something analyze something that i might struggle with so that I can later present it to my students or present it to you guys. So using YouTube and using teaching as a learning opportunity for myself is really great. That's why in this video I'm not pretending like, let me show you how to draw animals because it's like, y'all, this is something I struggle with. I draw them, as you can see from Lilliputian Living, but I don't really draw them very often and I don't draw them with confidence and they're not really a major part. You wouldn't know I liked animals if uh, you didn't know me personally because I don't draw them enough. You can actually see one of his ears. I think it's a him. Maybe I'm wrong. Could be a her. I don't see any tusks and I think tusks are generally a male elephant thing that's gonna be something I find out when I go further in with our research and I'm doing all this talking because hey I like talking to you guys like sometimes when I'm doing my time-lapse videos I kind of miss just sharing what I know with y'all and having a con it's one-sided conversation but it feels like a conversation to me um <laughs> maybe that i should listen to people more um i i just like sharing what i'm observing and and talking about experiences and just kind of opening up and i don't really do that with the time lapse videos because they would take five ever and this one's going to be a long one too this one's going to be a, probably an hour i would guess but I thought it's important to kind of talk to you guys and walk you guys through what I'm doing and why I'm thinking what I'm thinking. One of my favorite things to do when I have art block is to just draw from reference and not worry about being imaginative or impressing anybody, but just work on doing studies like this one and it doesn't even have to be good it it's still investing in my future as an artist it's still serving a purpose later on but it doesn't exacerbate my art block we've got a really cute elephant image here of a mother and her child so i'm going to start with the mother or blocking in the mom because she takes up the most space and then i'm going to draw that little baby's head in there and they've got tusks maybe the one in the prior image had its tusks removed to save its life. And this is a good view of their heads. But it makes it a little difficult to see their bodies. So we're really just recording the information that's in front of us today. We're not necessarily looking things up or figuring things out today. We're just sketching. 
So I'm just going to draw what's in front of me. And the reason I'm doing this instead of like guessing or looking it up, if I were doing this for a standalone illustration, I would definitely look it up. But we are just kind of on a fact finding mission today. We're just kind of figuring ourselves out. So now we've got the trunks. And working this way is also great because honestly, some animals are just a lot of fun to draw. And it seems like from this view, these elephants are a lot of fun to draw. So by taking a more relaxed approach, you can just kind of enjoy yourself. Now, if you're the sort of really, really analytical person who just has to know the answers and that's really fun for you, you know, that might be different. But not all of us are like that. Sometimes we have to play a little before we can study. This is a good way to just kind of play a little. And if you're the sort of person who enjoys drawing fantasy animals like dragons or animals from your imagination or Pokemon even, it's really beneficial to understand how to draw real animals before you kind of stress yourself out about drawing like the world's best dragon. Because historically these animals, those fictional animals, those historical animals are historical, mythical animals are based off of combinations of real animals, either because the people who first saw them misunderstood what was going on or because it's easier to invent an animal from existing animals rather than to completely make it up out of whole cloth. So I really can't see what's going on with this leg. That's kind of okay. It's in shadow. And Elephants look like their shoulders, their legs, especially on this female elephant. They come up really high. Okay, so now we have our bebe. We've drawn a lot of animals today. We've filled a lot of sketchbook pages and it's become one of my goals to fill a sketchbook a month again. So this is all kind of feeding back into that goal because I need to be sketching more. I need to be drawing from reference and practicing more. It's about creating this mental library of images that you can kind of reference and rely on. It's about developing the muscle memory in your hands. And it's also about building confidence. So much of drawing is just about practice and putting that practice in. And if you're like me and you're kind of a weaker artist, it takes you longer to understand how to draw things. It takes you longer to uh, improve. It takes you longer to catch up with where everyone else is. Honestly, I have to draw twice as much as I think a lot of other people have to in order to be half as good. I've known this for a really, really long time. I've accepted this fact. So it's really just about putting the mileage in and putting the time in. So today we drew pretty much a whole zoo full of animals. And this is the first video in kind of a mini series on just drawing animals. There's a lot of great videos, a lot of great tutorials, a lot of great channels that focus on drawing animals a bit more academically than what I'm looking to do here. I highly recommend you check out Aaron Blaze's channel. It's a wonderful reference. Hopefully you guys also saw as since I did this as my warm up, you saw the progress, you saw the drawings improve as we went along from this kind of ratchet looking lion 
to much better bears, to some decent raccoons, to some all right bats, to some mediocre dolphins, to more mediocre dolphins, to an all right elephant to, hey, pretty decent elephant. So not only did we kind of explore drawing different animals and we talked about finding the major forms, but we also kind of understood or grew to understand why doing drawing warm-ups before you commit to your drawing of the day or whatever art project you're working for that day, why doing warm-ups are beneficial. My hand feels much more limber. My muscles have loosened up a little bit. My arthritis has eased up a bit. So now I could be ready to dive into the main project for the day. So I highly recommend you guys do drawing warm-ups before you commit to your drawing regimen for that day. I have some more animal drawing videos coming up in the near future that I hope you guys will look forward to. I also have a giant playlist of my favorite drawing tutorials that I hope you guys will check out. In our next video, we're gonna talk about breaking down these animal forms volumetrically. And in the video after that, we're gonna talk about how to create stick figures. That's gonna allow us to pose our animals based on the skeleton. Blah. Blaze, ba <laughs> based on the skeletons of these animals. So I hope you guys are looking forward to those videos and I hope to see you guys again really soon. Have a wonderful day guys. Bye!